I'm Ron Hawkins, uh, Director of Industry Relations at SDSC. Today we have uh, we have an encore performance from uh, Giga IO. I think they joined us uh, a couple of years ago, and you know this is this is a company that's really been in, been in it for the long game, in the fullness of time as as we've seen the emergence of uh, greater reliance on heterogeneous computing. Uh, we've seen the uh, GPUs emerge as the kind of the workhorse for AI and machine learning and even some HPC simulation workloads. Uh, we've seen the rise of uh, application specific accelerators like FPGAs and the new crop of uh, deep learning and, and neural network chips. And, and this, this need for uh, disaggregation and, and composability um, in large scale computing environments has, uh, has, has really become uh, evident. So, uh, you know, this is a, this is a company that, that had a, had a vision, uh, you know, they kind of saw the future and, and they've, uh, you know, they've, uh, as I've said, played, played the long game and brought this technology to market. So, um, it's really, uh, it's really a great, uh, great story for, uh, San Diego startup, and um, you know we're, we've got uh, Alan Benjamin, the, the CEO here today, to uh, you know give us an update on the on the technology and the and the product and the the application. So, without further ado, I will hand it off to Alan. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Ron, and and uh, you know obviously all the work that we've done with San Diego Super Computing over the years has uh, been invaluable to, to us. And, you know, we really, really thank you for inviting us to give this presentation and update today, because you're right, it, it is, it's, uh, it, you know, over the last several years, trends have really moved in the direction where, you know, the obviousness of needing a fabric-based computing is becoming quite evident. So, I'm going to share some things about what our network does and why we do what we do. And then uh, towards the back end, we'll talk about some data, right? And we'll show, you know, what is it that, uh, you know, people have, you know, issues in terms of, oh, geez, am I going to lose performance if I do this? And in fact, we're going to show you it's just the opposite that, you know, your, your flexibility goes up, your performance goes up. So, you know, Ron alluded to why heterogeneous computing. So we'll just start with that as, uh, as, as a course. Uh, you know, Moore's Law, and, and these slides are from NVIDIA, and now obviously they have a lot of interest in showing that Moore's Law has actually run its course. Intel slides look a little different, but I, you know, at the end of the day, nobody really disputes the fact that uh, CPUs in and of themselves alone do not drive performance any longer and it's more of an architectural question. And, you know, heterogene heterogeneous compute uh, really does help uh, uh, tremendously in terms of performance. And, uh, you know, with NVIDIA's help and AMD's help, and now Intel is really into this, the number of applications now that can take advantage of GPUs and other kinds of accelerators has really exploded. And so, you know, it, it was interesting, I, I looked at this data Five years ago, this number was less than 300, and you know it's uh, this is this is a couple of months old data now at 1800, and we're probably up to 2,000. I mean, the pace at which applications are being modified to take advantage of GPUs is really accelerated. And by the way, that's one of the issues, and we'll talk about that. So. You know, the, the, the reality is once you start to uh, take advantage of different kinds of accelerators, you know, the accelerator is going to take a particular math library or a math function and is going to accelerate it. Well, once you start down the path of I can use an accelerator to enhance the performance of a particular aspect of a program, why not use, you know, you can pick multiple libraries that in fact can get accelerated. And so once you go down the path of heterogeneous, you know, ideally you want to be able to take advantage of a lot of different compute uh, capabilities. And, you know, we talk about GPUs, but it could be multiple kinds of GPUs. It could be FPGAs. You know, Ron, Ron talked about, uh, you know, new ASICs. 
Uh, I know a couple months back, the NEC folks did a presentation in the same forum talking about their vector processor unit. So, you know, we can take advantage of any and all, ideally, once you start down the path of, look, I want to put, I want to put the computation where it's best run. And even though today we're going to do a lot of, con do a lot of talking around the compute side, the storage side is the same. And so whether or not you want to use NVMe drives or even rotating media or Optane, you know, Intel Optane storage or Intel Optane uh, persistent memory or even memory itself, in the ideal world, all of this should be part of the mix and you should be able to, to do that. Question would be, do you actually have an interconnect capability to tie it all together? And that's exactly why we're here today to talk about it. So the challenges, uh, you know, for the IT organizations, whether it's, you know, San Diego Supercomputer or, uh, you know, the enterprises, it's really an interesting time uh, for these folks because the challenges are not small, right? On one hand, you know, it's just a simple fact. The refresh cycle on servers just does not match the innovation cycle on GPUs. And we have heard from so many people that they buy a server, they want to put it on a three to five, maybe even a seven year depreciation schedule. But oh, by the way, the GPU or the FPGAs, they want to refresh every 18 to 24 months. And so there's this, if you've taken that GPU and you've put it inside the server, you're either writing off the server well before they would like to, or they're having to hold on to these accelerators. So these, these things just simply do not match and, and people want to change. Uh, the workloads are, are, are diversifying and they're expanding. And we'll talk about you know, some of the use cases here in, in, in a second. But suffice it to say that is, as uh, applications are starting to add in accelerators, they're all getting, shall we say, better. And better is a relative term. You know, people are adding, they're making their applications faster or they're making them more accurate or they're adding in the capability to add more elements in. So all of the workloads are expanding. And at the same time, most of the organizations are being asked to take in a very different new kind of workload of artificial intelligence and data analytics. And those workflows look quite different. But the infrastructure looks similar to what the scientific computing is, is doing. And so they're being asked to take on these workloads. And the hardware itself is, is diversifying and expanding, right? We saw on the last page, the GP, there's more GPUs, there's more FPGAs, they're becoming more specialized. And so you've got new workload expanding. And so, but at the end of the day, the budgets aren't increasing. And so people have to be able to do more with the hardware that they've got. And, you know, we've seen from a number of studies you take a GPU and you stick it inside of a, of a fixed infrastructure server and on average, it gets, 15 per, it gets used 15% of the time. And so for most organizations, they simply can't afford to buy really expensive devices and have them use so little. So how do you get more out of the infrastructure? So here's an example. Uh, you know, we talked to a number of companies. This is a, a, an automotive company. And they would say, look, you know, at the end of the day, we've got half a dozen to a dozen applications that our folks use all the time. And, you know, you know, we wrote down the ones that they they are using. Every one of these, every one of these seven are uh, uh, going through change. They're all adding capabilities to add in uh, uh, GPUs and FPGAs. But as you would expect, every one of these applications, they are lumpy in what they require, right? Some want more memory, some want higher IO traffic, some of them want more GPUs, some of them want a couple of stages of GPUs. So they're all lumpy. And as they would say, they're getting lumpier. And of course the lumps don't add up. And you know, the way they could tee it, it needs to, needs to evolve is different than ANSID Fluent. And so you know, the question here becomes, there's really some difficult choices that uh, you know, the folks that run the systems now uh, have to make. And so they either are facing 
the challenge of having to build multiple infrastructures. So take that last seven, they either go down the path of building seven different infrastructures, right? Or they build a single infrastructure, they optimize it for one and they make it suboptimal for everything else. And in the end of the day, that sub-optimization can be really quite dramatic. So this one doesn't seem to be very appealing for many people, right? Because you've got one group that's really happy and you got six groups that are really unhappy. And so what if it's possible to be able to really dynamically be able to change the infrastructure so that you can satisfy the need for growth in all of these and pick up that new AI workload? And so we believe, you know, at the end of the day, fabric computing is in fact the key to making this happen. But there's some characteristics that have to be part of this solution if it's going to be successful. And, you know, number one, it, it has to deliver full performance. And we heard from a number of folks early on, and there was a quote that, that one of them gave us that was really uh, has driven what we've done. And they said, look, everything about disaggregation is fantastic, right? It delivers everything that we need, but I can't disaggregate unless I can re-aggregate again without getting killed in performance. And so, so the solution, the, the, the optimum solution here has to have full performance. It's got to have great bandwidth. It's got to have great latency. It's got to have both. It's got to work with any workload, right? And we, you know, we talked about, you know, once people go down this path, uh, you know, NVIDIA GPUs are fantastic, but they make a whole bunch of them. And oh, by the way, it's not just, uh, you know, AMD GPUs. If you're doing, uh, you know, double precision floating point, they're really very impressive now. Or, you know, Xilinx will make some great FPGAs. So, I mean, it's got to be able to work with any of the workloads and any of the components. It's got to be based on open standards because you just simply don't want to be locked in. And unfortunately, in this environment, an awful lot of people have gone down the vendor lock-in path, you know, the walled garden approach. And we, we as a company feel that it has to be open else it's the wrong approach. You wanna be able to scale these systems and it's not just scale them up. You wanna be able to scale them down to the component level. If this workload needs X number of GPUs or FPGAs, you wanna be able to put them together on the fly, run the job and, and do something else, right? It should be able to use my existing infrastructure you may have a bunch of servers that you say, look, I'd really like to add a GPU or two too easily, but also I want to be able to include some new servers, for example. So I may have, you know, a couple of racks of, uh, you know, existing, uh, you know, Skylake Intel servers, but oh, by the way, I want to add in some of the newer Ice Lakes, or I want to add in some of the uh, AMD based uh, servers or maybe even the ARM-based servers. So I want to be able to use all my existing infrastructure, but I also have to be able to easily accommodate new things. And at the end of the day, uh, God, we've heard this a thousand times, please. This has to be easy to deploy. It, I, it, it can't become more hassle. Uh, my IT staff has to be very capable of doing this. And ideally, I use my existing tools. You know, I'm using Slurm, I'm using Bright, I'm using, you know, control IQ, I'm using whatever, please let me use my existing tools to manage this also. And so we'll, what we have created is uh, what we call fabrics, right? It's a universal dynamic fabric and it is the only routable, and we underline the term because it's a really important term for us, it's the routable PCI and in the future CXL right throughout the rack. And it does, what what we've talked about it'll work with any workload any component it's based upon open standards gosh i mean we have thrown dozens of devices into some of our resource boxes and i don't think we've come i don't think we've run into one that simply does not work if they conform to the pci spec it just works and it runs at full performance right we have generation three we have generation four and at Gen 4, PCI Gen 4 speeds, we have things running at 256 gigabits, and it's really quite something to see, right? Uh, because of the fact that we're routable, we scale really well. And we'll talk about this because we handle server to server communication in addition to simply server to resources. And at the heart of the matter, 
you know, the difference between what we do in this dynamic fabric is that we are, you know, at the heart, PCI Express is in fact a data centric network. It is not a store and forward. So you're not storing data. You're not, uh, you know, putting in bounce buffers. And so it inherently uh, reduces latency and improves the security profile of, of the cluster. We'll, and, and as I said, we'll talk about this in the context of, uh, of compute elements, but it could very easily be storage as well. I mean, inherently, as you understand more about the fabric system, it really doesn't matter what the endpoints are, right? And we're, we're, we're very easy to move information from one GPU to an FPGA, for example, or from storage into, into an accelerator. And so we're just going to talk about this largely in terms of, of, of acceleration and compute today, but it is also storage and memory as well. So most infrastructure today is put together, you know, it's a static architecture. It is a rack full of servers that's connected either with InfiniBand or with Ethernet. Maybe it's Rocky, maybe it's not. And you have a certain number of servers. This, in this case, this was uh, Ron's configuration. Um, and which is very common. It's a very typical configuration, four GPUs per server, rack full of servers. And if you need to run a job, you put it on a server. So if you've got a job that's gonna need one GPU or three GPUs or four GPUs, it goes on one of the servers and it's gonna run. And if you need two, the other two are sitting there doing absolutely nothing. And if you need more than four servers, you run it on more than one server. And the communication between the two, if in the case of uh, if these are NVIDIA GPUs, it's a construct called GPU Direct RDMA. And we'll show you the performance penalty that you pay, right? If you try to, if you got to run a job here on eight GPUs, there's quite a bit of performance that is lost when you communicate between these two. Now, in the future, we think it goes this way. Right, so the fabric system is becomes the new top of rack switch, and we have resource boxes here where we will pull the GPUs out of the servers, and uh, they now become part of a uh, of a resource box. Uh, there's no in there, there's no servers in these boxes, right? I mean, they are simply a set of resources that are now available to anything in the network, and the servers consequently become much simpler. So all of the heating and cooling and all those sorts of requirements come out of, out of the servers. They become much simpler again. They go back to being, you know, in most cases, one U units. And oh, by the way, because we route PCI, we still do all the connections between the servers. So if you're running MPI jobs, for example, or anything that requires TCP IP or NVMe over fabrics or whatever, it runs natively on fabrics. So the servers now can access any of the GPUs and anything that's in the system. So real simply, you know, this is the simple composition and resource sharing. You know, you've got a job, you've got a handful of servers. One server grabs, you know, eight GPUs. The next server needs to have four. You're setting this up through, you know, the software that you're used to. So if you're running Slurm, you submit your Slurm job exactly the way you've always submitted your Slurm job. And we have worked with outside vendors now that have the Slurm plugin that will recognize the resources being requested and will compose this on the fly. Or if you're using OpenStack or Kubernetes or uh, you know, Singularity containers and control IQ software or bright computing or whatever software that you wanna run, we can run with. And you know, the job changes, you finish that one job, you reconfigure and you run a different job and you know this can go on all day long and you know you're you're reconfiguring this network as as your jobs progress and you're taking advantage of all the various accelerators that you have <clears throat> uh, we could continue to play that game you know ad infinitum people ask me all the time does it actually work and i'll tell you you know we of course use our own tools and our system and our development engineers and our QA engineers are uh, you know, quite desirous of the resources 
And, you know, being a smaller company, uh, you know, we, we can't afford to get everybody all the resources that they want at their own disposal to be used at 15% utilization. And so uh, we, did some, we did some measuring on the number of times we make changes a day to our infrastructure. We've got two racks of gear and we make almost 200 uh, system changes a day. Nobody touches a thing, right? It's all done via the software. It's all cabled up. We will physically reconfigure our equipment about 200 times a day. And I get it, right? That's extreme in terms of, you know, the sort of changes that people want to make, but it works and we've been doing it for quite some time now. So, you know, one of the other benefits here is it gives you a lot of different flexibility. So we've shown that, you know, we were using one, one kind of accelerator. Well, you know, there's nothing to say that in these resource boxes, you can't have you know, some GPUs that are really quite good at, you know, let's say high precision floating point. And maybe you then want to run some different types of accelerators for inferencing. And maybe you want to add in some FPGAs and you want to add in something that can do the visualization parts of your workloads. And so you don't, you're not tied to a particular kind of accelerator in these boxes. And it's very easy to add resources as you grow. And so, you know, you don't have to add large slugs of racks of racks of equipment or uh, whatnot. You know, you need to add a handful of, of GPUs into your system to improve performance. You add a couple of GPUs. It's very easy to add and upgrade and change as, as you go. And, and because these, th these boxes from us are actually uh, 10 slot devices, you can also add, for example, Intel, Intel Optane drives directly into the box and have really fast access to, to you know, scratch memory, for example. And, and at the end of the day, you know, increasingly people want to let the workflow drive the composition of a, of a particular server or of a cluster, right? So, you know, let the workflow, the workflow is gonna be optimal across a couple of devices. And I'm gonna show you an example here of a moment with, at work we did with, with uh, SDSC, where we did exactly this and we got really some dramatic results from being able to let the workflow, configure the system to match the workflow, not the other way around. And you know, one of the things, because of the fact that we do server to server, and I said we we're going to concentrate on uh, you know the compute side of things, there are times when you would like to have large pools of these accelerators working together, and this is often quite difficult to do. So in this particular case, there's 16 GPUs. There's very few servers on the market that can actually handle 16 GPUs. And it's going to be a relatively newer server that can even handle eight. And so in this case, you know, we're running a nickel ring, an NVIDIA nickel ring across all 16 GPUs. And oh, by the way, we've, we've, extended, we've extended the nickel ring now out to 32 GPUs, which is uh, uh, really kind of interesting because very few people can do it, we've been told. And so whether or not you're running this on, you know, if you've got two servers that can handle eight GPUs each, or maybe you've got some older servers that you would really like to continue to get more benefit from, uh, and they can only handle two or four GPUs. Guess what? You can still pull these together because across fabrics, we can run that GPU direct RDMA across the various servers and still give you a large pool, even if the servers themselves can't handle it. So now let's talk about some of the performance tests. So you might say, you know, geez, this is really great. I can, I can, I can disaggregate, I can re-aggregate, but what happens on the performance side? And so we're going to show you what, what, what now comes. Uh, on the GPU side, we're going to talk about comparing what we will call converged. And that's when you put a GPU inside of a server, one or more. So what happens when we put GPUs inside of a server? What happens when we compose GPUs to servers. So we put them in that resource box and through the Fabrics network, attach them to a server. 
what happens when we run GPU direct RDMA across multiple servers? And then I'll show you a case on scaling uh, out to larger sizes of numbers of GPUs. And then I'm going to show you uh, the work that we have done with San Diego Supercomputer that sort of brings that all together. All right, so test number one and, and data is converged versus composed. Uh, converged, in this case, we took eight GPUs and stuck them inside of a server. And so, you know, it was one of the one of the big servers, in this case, the Supermicro uh, Big Twin. Uh, we added eight GPUs. This particular server, four GPUs are attached to a particular processor, four to the other processor. And so communication, if you're going from one side to the other, goes through the UPI bridge. Everything else can communicate uh, GPU to GPU. One benefit of being able to compose GPU, so we took all eight GPUs and stuck them inside our resource appliance. The all, you know, they will all talk to each other directly uh, across our across our network. If you and I'll show you, if you have multiple boxes, right, it never has to come back to the compute node, and that has a large impact on performance. So, here's composed versus converged, and you can see the results are are the same. So in the in, in, so this is one GPU, whether you put it inside the server or whether you compose it to the server has no impact on performance. And in fact, when you got to the eight, the composed, right, being in that resource box actually runs significantly faster than having them inside the server. So architecturally, whether you put them in the server or whether you compose them will have little impact. Um, and in fact, it may, it may be beneficial depending upon the server itself. So now let's look at what happens if you run a job where you have the GPUs effectively inside a server. In this case, we composed, we took all eight, we composed them to a server right, ran what NVIDIA calls GPU direct, the ability for GPUs to talk to themselves within the box. And we compared it to running uh, RDMA, right? So this is, we have two compute nodes where we've composed GPUs. So effectively we have the same eight GPUs and you can think of it as four GPUs in this server, four GPUs in this server, and we're gonna run the job across uh, the entire construct. And in this case, instead of running a GPU direct over InfiniBand or over Ethernet, we're running it over fabrics. And this one probably will surprise you, right? Because the results would show, and let me, let me explain this real quick. We have two tests here. We have ResNet 50 and we have Inception testing. And the blue bars in each case are the number of GPUs that are in one server. So this is eight GPUs sitting inside of one server. The yellow bars are the same number of GPUs just split up between two different servers. So in this case, this is four GPUs in two servers for a total of eight as compared to having eight GPUs in one server. And so you can see, which is, and, and I'm going to show you the data from San Diego Super in a second. This is uh, quite surprising to most people because in normal cases, if you have to communicate across two different servers, you lose uh, some considerable performance. And in our case, running this across fabrics, it simply doesn't matter. So whether you have two GPUs composed to a server, which was the same as two GPU sitting inside the server, or you put one in each, right? You're gonna get the same numbers. So if you're trying to revitalize older servers, this is a great construct now. So you can, you can easily add GPUs to older servers. And when you need to do larger jobs, you can still run that job across multiple servers. And it is interesting to note, once again, when you get out to larger numbers, you know, in this case, we're actually running faster when we've split the jobs up. And I will say this becomes heavily dependent upon the software. We have other cases where this will be slightly less performant. Uh, in the ResNet inception testing, you can see it actually does better to split across multiple servers because 
but the GPU is much more efficient in the compute. The CPU still does it. And so having more CPUs still actually helps the result. And then in terms of scaling, we took a, we, for fun, we took a case where we took, uh, we took 32 GPUs and we put them into various, you know, we, we put them into the resource boxes, attached it to a compute node and were successful in getting this construct to run well. And as you can see, it scales, you know, the performance factor across fabric scales really well. And whether we were doing this, in this case, this was one, one compute node with 32 GPUs, or from the last chart, you could see if we split this up and put eight and four different servers, you're gonna get pretty much the same results here. So your ability to scale out when you need larger numbers of GPUs is gonna work really well. So now let's talk about the San Diego use cases. We've done, we've done uh, with Ron's help, we've done uh, some really nice work. Uh, this one was done about 18 months ago now. Uh, and it's, it's really germane to the, to, to the topic. So one of the applications that they run there is a uh, seismic uh, simulation package called AWP. And Ron initially uh, gave us the mandate, he said, the existing setup runs pretty well. Uh, is there a way to match that performance and, but for less money? And so it was pretty, it was a pretty interesting uh, uh, challenge. And I'll, and I'll tell you up front, uh, we did not succeed in, in his challenge because at the end of the day, uh, we could not we, 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 we could not match the performance. We actually kept getting higher performance. So I'll, I'll just sort of lead, lead with that, right? We kept getting, you know, and at the end of the day, we delivered 25% higher performance for about a third of the cost. So we'll come back to this one. Let me, let me show you this, the, the test setup uh, that, that it was. The existing system was very similar to what we talked earlier. They have an InfiniBand switch. They had uh, four, four servers that they were using with four GPUs each. And initially our system looked very similar to this setup. And as the researcher, in this case is a gentleman by the name of Dawei Mu was working on the system, he started to realize that he didn't necessarily have to mirror the same setup and at the end of the day, he, he, this was the final configuration. It was actually, he went from four servers to one server where we started with four. And he was actually attaching all the GPUs to a single server and he added storage directly into the network. So now to come back, you know, we, we ended up with 25% higher performance. Um, what, you know, so the, their existing system is, you know, the Comet system there is, uh, uh, you can tell this is a couple years old now. They were running P100s at the time, uh, which, which then were $6,500 a piece. Uh, we were running 1080 TIs. We were a brand new startup company. We couldn't afford the P100s. Um, you know, the 1080 TIs, obviously, they're not there any longer. And they were, at the time, about $1,000 a piece. So on the uh, performance scale, what is it that the P100s got you? Well, lower is better on this chart. And so if you were running this on one GPU, you can see the P100 is about 50% faster, right? As an individual GPU. So that's what your $5,500 bought you for GPU cost uh, differential. However, once you got to four GPUs, we had actually caught up in performance. <clears throat> and remember now, this is $4,000 worth of GPUs that are now running at the same performance as $26,000 worth of GPUs. And when you got out to eight GPUs, we're actually running faster, considerably faster. And remember, this is $8,000 of GPUs against over $50,000 worth of GPUs in Comet. And so, and what's happening here is the utilization of the GPUs and this is that performance penalty. I talked about the penalty that you pay for GPU direct across the networks as they exist, the legacy networks. You can see the utilization of the GPUs drops dramatically. Meantime, in fabrics, it's still run, chugging along well into the mid nineties. And so even though they're a less powerful GPU, the fact that they're fully utilized, fully stocked with memory, 
uh, keeps them keeps them moving right along. Now that study then got Dawe thinking, and he actually proposed this process. And this is back to letting the workflow decide the configuration. And so it turns out in, in the work that they do, they actually have a two-step process. So they're getting the data in from the field. Step number one is to do the computation on all the field measures. So they can actually do the computation on the seismic waves themselves. And step number two then is to take the, the, the output of the computation and run a visualization so they can watch this seismic wave roll down the hillside. And what they had been doing, these were two completely separate steps. And in fact, in some cases, they ran them on completely separate machines. So they would take the data, they would move it into step number one, they would do all the computing, they would move it back. And then as a in serial process, they would then run the visualization and they would move the data another time and they would run the visualization process and move it back and then view it. So Dawe realized he had complete control over how the GPUs and how the CPUs inter interacted with each other. And so what he did was he took a handful of the GPUs. In this case, we still kept the same model. So these could have and today, these probably would now be visualization GPUs. You know, this could be A100s over here, for example, and these could be, you know, RTX family. In his case, he was still using, you know, the same GPUs. But he, he took the data, he moved it to step number one to do the compute. And instead of moving it back and running it separately, the output of the compute was fed directly into the visualization GPUs. And... You know, the results were really dramatic because it cut the time for him to do the entire workflow, which is really what mattered. He cut it in half. And a side benefit that he has noted is that most other applications that were running actually improved in performance because he reduced the network traffic because he stopped moving the network, the, the data back and forth so many times. And so you know, um, he made the comment, instead of, instead of worrying about data offloads and so on, just don't move the data as often. So in summary, you know, IT is being asked to, to do a lot more work than they've ever, than they've ever uh, had to do. They're supporting really uh, dramatically expanding workloads, a diversifying uh, architecture in terms of acceleration and storage. And oh, by the way, they're being asked to do it on the same budget. And as we've seen, each of the workloads, they're lumpy. They're lumpy in their own ways. And so it's not just a matter of putting together an infrastructure with a bunch of different resource, right? You need to be able to optimize these architectures and ideally let the workflow determine the infrastructure as opposed to forcing the workflow to deal with the architecture that you've got. And so we really do believe then that fabrics it, as a universal dynamic fabric really lets I, I, IT do this. So it enables you to improve the system performance by adding in all of these new accelerator technologies. You can very easily revitalize existing infrastructure you do not have to go out and do forklift upgrades on everything that's there. And therefore it makes it much easier to meet budget requirements. And because you're getting better utilization out of the resources, you get better sustainability and better uh, power usage. So with that, I am done and we will open it up to questions that may have uh, come in. And thank you, Alan, for you and your team for uh, the update today. And uh, like I said, the, you know, it's, it's, it's been a marathon, not a sprint for you guys. So con con congratulations on all the, the projects and, and, and uh, our progress and, and where you've been able to get to with the, uh, with the technology. And we look forward to hearing from you guys again and, and doing more with you.